In this video, we're going to get an overview of the Kubernetes attack surface through a fun demo of hacking into a Kubernetes cluster. If you're visiting our channel for the first time, don't forget to subscribe as we release new videos every week. Let's start by gaining a high level understanding of the Kubernetes attack surface through a demo of an attack. Throughout the rest of the course, we will discuss this in detail, learn how it happened, and look at the different ways that this could have been prevented. Now, before we begin, here's a quick disclaimer. This is a true story. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed, and out of respect for the attack, the rest has been told exactly as it occurred. So here's how it goes. So it's time for the much-awaited election between cats and dogs and everyone has to cast their votes to elect the next party. The web portal to cast votes is open and is available at www.votes.com. The results are at www.result.com. The poll has been open for a while and it's the last day to cast your votes. Now, as seen in the results page, among the thousands of votes casted, dogs have been winning by a huge margin. Now, along came a person who calls herself Cat Girl, and clearly she's not a dog person. She has been watching dogs continue to win for a while now, and she decides that it's time to bring about a change. It's time for cats to rule the world. She knows a thing or two about applications and infrastructure and decides to give it a shot. Now, so far, the only thing that she knows about the applications is two domain names, vote.com and result.com. Now, these are two applications that could be running anywhere, probably developed in WordPress or PHP or Python or Ruby or Java. It could be hosted on cloud or pass platforms or on on-prem infrastructure, and they could be running on physical hosts or virtual machines or even in containers. Now, there could be different kinds of databases involved, and she has no idea what or how these applications are hosted. So there's a lot to figure out. Now, as the first step, she tries to identify the IP addresses of these applications. So she, in her fancy terminal, pings the applications and it responds with an IP address. Both the applications respond with the same IP address, which leads her to believe that they are hosted on the same infrastructure. Next, she performs a port scan of all ports on that server, hoping to get something that might help her get through to the server. Now, out of all the ports scanned, she struck luck with one of the ports, the one that the Docker service listens on. So that's a new find. The infrastructure runs Docker, so the applications are most likely running as containers. Now, with the Docker port available, she can only hope that there is no authentication or authorization enabled, which is the default behavior. She runs a Docker command to list containers, but with the host flag pointing to the server hosting the voting application. And voila, it lists the running containers. There are numerous containers running on the host that she can't make any sense out of. She can also see the version of the Docker engine running on the host. So next, she must learn more about the environment and understand the various servers involved and the different components of the voting application, specifically the database. For this, she runs a privileged container based on the Ubuntu image. This privileged container can then be used to escape into the underlying host. So she's now on a privileged container on the server hosting the voting application. She's aware of a vulnerability named dirty cow that can be exploited to escape out of the container onto the underlying host. She attempts to download a script from her own server. However, there is no curl or uh, the wget utility, so she attempts to install them. Since there are no restrictions in place to prevent her from installing binaries, the applications can be installed easily. Once successful, she downloads the dirty cow exploit script and runs it to escape out of the container onto the host.
She now has terminal to the underlying host and she runs different commands to verify the same. At this point, she can infiltrate the remainder of the network and attack other systems as well. She can shut down servers and bring the entire application down. She learns about the volumes mounted and that the name of the node um, is worker. But what worker? She explores the running container looking for something that will help her gain more information about the infrastructure. She sees a number of containers with name K8s. So these containers are hosted on a Kubernetes cluster. This node must be a worker node in a Kubernetes cluster. One of the containers is running a Kubernetes dashboard. Now it must be exposed on a port on the node. To see that, she lists the IP table rules on that node and looks for a Kubernetes dashboard. She identifies that the port that exposes the Kubernetes dashboard is 30080. On visiting that port, the Kubernetes dashboard is made available publicly without any security settings. The Kubernetes dashboard provides information about the entire cluster, the different nodes that are part of the cluster. It seems to be a single master, single worker node Kubernetes cluster. The namespaces on the cluster can be seen, and under the deployments, all the applications hosted are listed. Apart from the voting and results services, the application consists of a DB service, a Redis service, and a worker. Now, what we are interested in is the DB service. Exploring the DB pod reveals the username and password used to connect to the database stored as environment variables, and that's what she needs. She then identifies the database container and execs into it. Once in, she uses the username and password stored in the environment variable to connect to the database using the PSQL utility. Once in the database, she identifies the table that stores the votes. Viewing the contents of the table lists all the votes. Now, all that is left to be done is to update the votes that were cast for dogs and change them to cats. She quickly writes a script to update random votes and executes it. And now it is only a matter of time before the election is overturned. Well, so that was a quick and high level overview of the various things that could go wrong if proper security measures are not put in place. There were multiple areas that were vulnerable to attack. To begin with, the cloud itself. The infrastructure that hosted the Kubernetes cluster was not properly secured and enabled access to ports on the cluster from anywhere. If network firewalls were in place, we could have prevented remote access from the attacker's system. This is the first C in cloud native security. It refers to the security of the entire infrastructure hosting the servers. This could be a private or a public cloud, a data center hosting physical machines, a co-located environment. We discuss more about this in the last section of the course where we talk about how to detect all phases of attack regardless of where it occurs and how it spreads. The next is cluster security. The attacker was easily able to gain access through the Docker daemon exposed publicly as well as the Kubernetes dashboard that was exposed publicly without proper authentication or authorization mechanisms. This could have been prevented if security best practices were followed in securing the Docker daemon, the Kubernetes API, as well as any GUI we use to manage the cluster such as the Kubernetes dashboard. We look into these in much more detail in the first section of the course where we talk about cluster setup and hardening. We will see how to secure the Kubernetes daemon and the Kubernetes dashboard as well as other best practices to be followed such as using network policies and security in ingress. Next comes containers. The hacker was able to run any container of her choice with no restrictions on what repository it is from or what tag was used. 
the attacker was able to run a container in privileged mode, which should have been prevented. The attacker was also able to install whatever application you wanted on it without any restriction. These could have been prevented if restrictions were put in place to only run images from a secure internal repository and if running containers in privileged mode was disallowed. And through sandboxing, containers could be isolated in a better way. We discuss these in the minimize microservice vulnerabilities section as well as the supply chain security sections of the course. And finally, code. Code refers to the application code itself. Hard coding applications with database credentials or passing critical information through environment variables or exposing applications without TLS are bad coding practices. Well, that's all for now. Once again, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos. To learn more about security in cloud native computing and Kubernetes, check out our course on Certified Kubernetes Security Specialist. Uh, in this course, we go in depth um, in each of these areas that we just discussed and understand about common vulnerabilities and security concerns in an environment and how to protect our systems from an attack. The course is fully hands-on with lab activities that will help you validate and remember what you learned in the videos. This will also help you prepare and pass the Certified Kubernetes Security Specialist exam from Linux Foundation. So join our community of students at cks.codecloud.com. Thank you.